Hello guys, my name is Tom Antos and today I've got a cool gift for you guys and a tutorial actually. Uh, the gift uh, are these uh, photo and video cheat sheets. These are basically these little, uh, little like basically sheets or little things that you can print out uh, that are that have all the information basically so that uh, in case you're let's say you're a beginner and you have no idea what all the camera different camera settings do, well you're gonna be able to quickly sort of you know track it down. But even if you're uh, somebody who's maybe a little bit more experienced, you know how to you know basically operate your camera, but you want to know how to take like full creative control of all, all the you know camera settings, then this sheet basically will break it all down for you, so you can easily sort of identify what it is that you have to do. If let's say you want to get a very shallow depth of field, get that more of a cinematic look, or maybe let's say you're on a steady cam or a gimbal and you want to get a really deep depth of field. Uh, or you know you want to get better exposure or, or better white balance things like that everything is on here all of this information and, and this is basically just this image that you can download on my website which is uh, tomantosfilms.com and then go to slash downloads uh, if you go over there you'll be able to download this uh, along with all the other cool free downloads that i have over there like free free lots and camera presets and things like that or the widescreen bars um, but anyways, uh, like I said, download this, uh, you can, you know, just keep it on your phone or something so you can always have it sort of as a reference or even better if you want, just go, you know, go to your local photography store uh, and just print out these. They're, I designed it so that they fit perfectly on a 4x6 basically photo. So it's super cheap, print it out, print out even a bunch of these uh, or, you know, uh, print out one and maybe laminate it or something so it doesn't get damaged or like you can see here, I just have a whole bunch of these and I give them away to people. Uh, but I also keep one always myself because, uh, you know, even though I know all the all the settings, one setting that I always have problems with is still the white balance. Uh, I just, you know, when you have to manually dial in the, the, the white balance settings, I always forget what the, what the numbers are. But anyways, I'm going to sort of break it all down for you and I'll show you what each of these basically things is. What, you know, kind of explain to you how this cheat sheet works. And, and at the same time also teach you all the basically all the fundamentals that are necessary for good video or, or uh, photos. Uh, so let's get started. So the first thing you'll see here on the top of the cheat sheet is uh, uh, are basically three separate uh, kind of you know sections. One is called aperture. Then uh, to the right you have shutter, and then below that you have ISO. And you'll notice all three of those are kind of connected with these little um, kind of you know, circular arrows. Uh, the reason why I did it like that is to kind of show you that these three settings, uh, even though they all kind of you know create different effects, uh, they also have one main thing in common, and that is they uh, adjust the overall exposure. Uh, or you know, for those of you who don't know what that means, just basically means the brightness or the darkness of your shot. Um, so meaning, if you adjust any one of these settings, you'll always have to compensate with one of the other, or maybe combination of the other two settings, to get the, the perfect exposure. So first, uh, let me just sort of break down each one of these and explain what they are and what they actually do. First one, as you can see up here, is aperture. Uh, aperture is basically the opening in the lens uh, and it basically controls how much light actually enters into basically through the lens and actually hits the, the image sensor of your camera. Uh, it is measured in f-stops but sometimes also in t-stops. And that really just depends on uh, what kind of a lens you have. So if you have sort of a typical photography lens, uh, like the one I have up here, uh, it's pretty much going to be always in measured in f-stops. Um, that's because that's just a you know, photography standard. Uh, also, a lot of photography lenses, especially the newer ones, will not have an aperture ring up here, meaning you will not be able to see any aperture settings here. Uh, so to adjust the, the actual aperture or the opening inside the lens, you will have to do it electronically through your camera settings when the lens is connected. Now, if you have a cinema lens like this one, as uh, is a, a Bauer uh, Cinema 85mm lens, you'll notice that this one has the focus ring, so you can do focus manually, but also because it's a, a lens designed specifically for video uh, and sort of a cinema lens, um, then that's why it also has a manual ring for the aperture. So as I rotate this ring, that's how I, I would actually adjust the, the aperture or the, basically how big the opening is in the lens. So here, in case uh, you know, if you, you've never seen this before, I'll just kind of show you guys. You can see the lens up here, and here, I'm, as I'm going to be adjusting the aperture ring, right now it's pretty much all the way closed, and now, for example, I'm going to open it. So you'll see that more light actually travels uh, through the, basically the lens, because the opening is bigger. And then if I close the aperture, 
uh, that means that less light is going to travel. Uh, another thing you have to be aware of is, like I said, this is a cinema lens, so it's T-Staps. It sort of works the same way as F-Staps, it's just uh, the numbers are a little bit slightly off. They're not, uh, they don't line up perfectly. But uh, what I mean uh, is that basically the way it operates is the same because the higher the F-Stop or T-Stop number, that means that the smaller the opening is or the more you've closed the lens down. And the lower the number, the lower the T-stop or the F-stop number, that means that you're open the lens you know, wider. So that's how you would actually control uh, the exposure of your shot, is by basically deciding how much light you want to let in through the lens. Now you also got to be aware that each one of these settings, including the aperture, also creates different eff effects, different creative kind of uh, effects, you know, that decides basically or changes the way your shot looks. So uh, if you open the aperture, you know, all the way up, basically or let in as much light as you can aside from getting you know a brighter or bigger exposure uh, you're also going to get a shallower depth of field that's the main sort of creative thing that the uh, aperture changes uh, depth of field is basically just the amount of uh, you know, basically the area in your shot that's actually in focus like right now the depth of field the sort of sweet spot right now is where i'm sitting but anything if it goes like too far away from me or if it goes further back like the the little pond over there behind me it's going to start going out of focus. But obviously you sometimes want to control that. So let's say if you want to get a sort of a classic portrait shot, uh, which is, you know, you want to get the person and, you know, you don't really want to get the, the, anything in the behind or in front of them in focus. You just want the focus to be just on that person. That's when you want to use a very narrow depth of field. So the aperture, like I said, uh, allows you to control that. And the lower the F-stop or T-stop number, then the narrower the depth of field is going to be or less things are going to be in focus. So you would set your aperture to set the lowest basically the lens can go to. So in the case of this lens, that's uh, T1.5. In the case of this lens, that's actually F2.8. That's basically the lowest number you can go to. You would set it to that and then you would uh, accordingly adjust all the other settings uh, to get you know, the sort of a perfect exposure so your shot doesn't look too bright or too dark. And you would adjust basically then uh, the aperture uh, first because you care mainly about getting a specific look to the depth of field uh, and then you would uh, accordingly adjust the shutter speed and the uh, and, um, uh, ISO to kind of get the, the perfect sort of exposure. Now if let's say if you want to get a, sort of a wide you know landscape shot let's say maybe you wanted to show me and exactly what's happening behind me there well, that's when sometimes you want a really wide depth of field. So meaning more things are in focus. So again, simple, you would just do the opposite. Go to the highest uh, F-stop or T-stop number and you're gonna get a bigger or more things basically in focus. And you can see here on the photo cheat sheet that you know I have a basically up here, uh, the little sort of a bar that goes from all the way from on the bottom. It's very dark. As you go up, it gets brighter. Uh, that basically represents that, you know, uh, if you go adjust the settings accordingly, what it says on the left side, for example, if you go to f1.4, it means it's going to be brighter than f5.6, or it's going to be b b brighter exposure. Or, for example, f22, that would be like, for example, you know, way, way darker than uh, f1.4. Now, obviously, that's going to be different on every lens. Depends what lenses you have. Some lenses can open, you know, really, really wide, you know, meaning they're going to have a really low f-stop or t-stop number. And that just usually it's referred to as uh, that it's a fast lens uh, that it basically can let in more light. Those lenses are usually going to be more expensive. The more affordable lenses are going to be usually start at f4, f3.5, somewhere around there. Uh, but anyway, so you can see the little you know pictures next to it. It shows if you go up, it gets brighter, lower f-stop number but also less things are in focus, only that little guy there is in focus and everything behind them is out of focus. And if you go to the opposite, it gets darker. And then also you can see here, uh, you know, that the depth of field gets wider. So you can see the little guy in focus and the mountains behind them. Um, and then you have a little sort of explanation of it on the right side. Now the next setting is the shutter. So shutter speed is also something that's gonna uh, control how much the overall basically brightness or how much of an exposure you're getting. Uh, but also creates other creative effects. So first of all, what is uh, shutter? Well, shutter is basically the amount of time that you're exposing the image sensor to, to light. Uh, back in the day, uh, or even today with uh, photography cameras, uh, still photography cameras, you'll have a shutter or a mirror uh, that will basically flip up, let in the light, hit the sensor, and then it's gonna flip down. 
on a motion picture camera back in the day, you would actually have a shutter that would be rotating shutter. It would basically rotate and you had a basically piece of film that would travel, it would stack, you know, stop in the gate, film gate. Uh, the shutter would, would be basically covering it while the film was moving, then it would rotate, it would uncover it, the light would basically expose the piece of film, and then it would rotate and then go cover it again so that the piece of film could move down again and it basically get in position to expose the next frame and then again the shutter would rotate, expose the next frame and so on and that happened you know uh, around you or well, usually around 24 frames, uh, 24 exposures per second. Uh, now these days in a video camera you don't actually have a, a physical shutter but you have what's called an electronic shutter meaning you just actually have the camera basically sensor kind of turns on and off. So when you look at the, again the little diagram here uh, basically, the, the uh, higher the shutter speed, and it's usually going to be measured in fractions of a second, um, at least for video terms. If you're doing photography, you could actually go into two or three or ten second exposures. But even for photography, usually it's fractions of a second. So let's say uh, one twenty-fourth of a second uh, is you know slower than, for example, one hundred ninety-two of a second, as you can see here on the bottom. Uh, so that just simply means that if you go, you're going to go faster or lower here on the diagram, that means that you're going to get less of an exposure. So less light you're going to let in because you're exposing the, the image sensor for a shorter amount of time because the, the shutter speed gets faster. Now another way of measuring a shutter, uh, and that's usually when you're working with cinema style uh, cameras, like let's say the red camera or the black magic uh, cinema cameras, the shutter will actually be measured in degrees, not in, uh, in uh, fractions of a second. And that's because they're kind of designing or they're kind of, you know, um, trying to basically make the camera appeal more to filmmakers who are used to working with traditional film cameras, which, like I said, back in the day, when you're shooting on film, you would actually have a rotating shutter. It would be basically it was a disc that was rotating and part of the disc was transparent and part of it was opaque and it would be basically just rotating. So if you want to just sort of compare the shutter degrees to uh, shutter basically speed or fractions of a second, it just simply means that the lower the shutter angle, that means that the faster the shutter speed is. And vice versa, if the shutter angle is higher, that, that's uh, the same thing as, for example, slowing down the shutter speed in like a traditional photography camera. Uh, so you can see here, I kind of, just as an example, I kind of you know, wrote in there 1 24th of a second exposure uh, would be the same as 360 degree, for example, shutter if you're shooting 24 frames per second. Another thing you got to be aware of too is, like I said, aside from controlling the, uh, the overall exposure, the brightness of your shot, uh, the shutter also creates effects uh, when, when it comes to the motion blur. Uh, the lower the shutter speed is, meaning the, the, there's going to be more motion blur in your shot. Uh, but uh, the second you start speeding up the shutter, and uh, basically the motion blur is going to get basically less and less noticeable until you're getting like perfectly crisp basically shots doesn't matter how fast basically somebody is, is let's say moving in your shot now another big misconception uh, out there is that uh, a lot of people think that you have to shoot at two times your frame rate or kind of more or less two times meaning if let's say you're shooting uh, you know standard let's say video for let's say like a film which will be uh, 24 frames per second people say that you have to you know, double that, meaning it will be 1 48th of a second shutter speed to get the, the perfect sort of a shutter setting. And I'm going to tell you right now, guys, that is not true. Uh, you do not have to do any such thing. You can shoot at any shutter speed that you want. And in fact, you should be aware of what different shutter speeds kind of uh, create or what kind of effects they create. So like I said, if your shutter speed is slower, simply means it's going to be a bit more blurred, your image. If it's faster, there's going to be less motion blur. So if you have a lot of action in the shot, uh, the, sh the shot might look a little bit stroby sometimes, or might look very like sort of crisp, very well defined, because there's no motion blur in it. Now, sometimes that's like a cool effect that you want. I'm sure you've seen, uh, for example, move, you know, action films, for example, like uh, the World War II film uh, Saving Private Ryan. Uh, in that film, on purpose, the filmmakers shot with a higher shutter speed so that everything, even though there was a lot of camera shake and you know, explosions and things like that, everything looked very kind of jarring, kind of almost shaky a little bit. Uh, so again, that's a, like a creative decision that the filmmakers uh, you know, chose over there. So you might ask yourself, why is it that so many people out there are saying that you, know, you should shoot with a 180 degree shutter or basically two times uh, your frame rate or your you know, frame rate that you're shooting at? Um, so let's say, you know, on 24 frames per second, 
a 180 degree shutter would be 1 48th of a second or somewhere around there cl as close to it now why is it that um, people think that that's the way you have to shoot and why is it that a lot of things are shot with those settings doesn't mean that you always have to shoot with those settings uh, but like I said a lot of projects are shot with that well it's not so much that uh, because you have to do it it's just simply because in the old old days of cinema when you're shooting on film and film stocks were not very fast for meaning they weren't very sensitive to light uh, you were shooting at ISO you know 10 50 you know, I even heard that you know when the first film stocks started coming out that were ISO 100 that was considered a really fast you know light sensitive uh, film uh, that just simply meant that sometimes there just wasn't enough of uh, basically they couldn't get enough of an exposure uh, so meaning that uh, they were basically looking at what's the lowest shutter speed that they can get away with and still get an exposure and and so on those days like i said if you're shooting at iso 50 or 20 or something like that um, usually like i said you'd be going to the lowest shutter speed uh, and so in a motion picture camera where you're trying to get to at least 24 exposures in a second uh, but you also have to have that shutter that kind of basically covered the piece of film while the film was basically traveling so you could expose the next frame and you had to have that shutter in there because without it if the film would just stop and expose and then move again it would be basically all the uh, pictures would be kind of blurry as the film was moving so you had to have the shutter kind of come in cover it while it was moving and then uncover it, it just simply meant that that shutter was basically like that circle half of it was transparent and half of it was opaque meaning half the time it was covering the piece of film and the other half it was uh, exposing it to, to light and that was basically the lowest shutter speed that they, they could get away with at those times uh, and like I said when film stocks were not very sensitive they needed all the exposure that they could get but later on as film stock got you know technology got a lot better and now obviously when we're shooting with uh, digital cameras that can go into you know ISO like in half a million or hundreds of thousands of, of you know basically ISO settings uh, that means that you can shoot you know sometimes even with, with practically no light right in the middle of the night like for example if you're shooting with a camera like the, the Sony a7s for example and so that means that then you have a lot more options in terms of the exposure and you can use different shutter speeds to create different effects so here's an example of a film that I did uh, where I on purpose shot it with a really uh, high shutter speed and if you just sort of look at the shot you'll notice that everything is handheld and even though there isn't that much camera movement there's a tiny bit of a shake and the reason why I shot it with a really high shutter speed is because with the lower shutter speed with the motion blur you didn't notice that little handshake as much whereas with the high shutter speed everything kind of uh, has a tiny bit of a jitter it's a bit more uh, noticeable and that means that like I said creatively it just creates a bit of this sort of a nervous feeling uh, I, I like to call so that's the reason why I chose those kind of settings in that film I also did this war film where again I used a really high shutter speed because I wanted to kind of simulate a similar look like what they did in uh, Saving Private Ryan where you know when the action happens and the actors are running around or explosions are happening and things like that everything kind of looks very crisp and sharp now another thing you got to be aware of is that if your frame rate that you're shooting at changes uh, and you want to get that classic film look meaning the 180 degree shutter meaning that then your shutter speed uh, should also change um, what I mean by that is for example if you're shooting with like a DSLR at 24 frames per second if you want to get that you know the most commonly used shutter speed like I said 180 degree shutter that means two times your frame rate or 1 48th of a second uh, most DSLRs or DSLM type cameras you will not be able to go exactly to 1 48th of a second but you can go somewhere around there like let's say 1 50th of a second so you can do that and uh, at that those settings you're gonna see that uh, you're getting you know sort of a more uh, I would say traditional motion blur I meaning the motion blur is there but it's not overly exaggerated now like I said today's cameras don't have an actual shutter moving in there so that means that you can go even lower than 180 degree shutter or what's called uh, let's say even a 360 degree shutter meaning there is no shutter um, so that would just simply mean that if you're shooting what uh, let's say uh, 24 frames per second then the shutter speed would be 1 24th of a second on this case I'm shooting a, a DSLM which is a Panasonic GH4 and so I shot with the shutter speed uh, set at 1 25th of a second it was the closest setting that I could get to that and you'll notice that there's drastically you know, a lot more motion blur now, sometimes that might be a cool effect in this case I think for just sort of a standard video I think it looks too blurred too kind of uh, almost dreamy looking 
So in that case, I probably wouldn't use it. But let's say for a specific scene or a, or a film project, I sometimes might want that kind of a look. Now, if you want the opposite of that, then that's when you're going to be speeding up the shutter. Uh, so if I go, for example, more or less four times the shutter, uh, the, the shutter speed compared to my frame rate, and then you can see there's drastically less motion blur, and the shots look a little bit more crisper and sharper. Uh, and then the same thing if I go even eight times faster than my uh, frame rate. Now, another thing, thing you gotta be aware of, like I said, is if your frame rate changes. So let's say if you're shooting slow motion stuff. So in this case, I was getting shots that were shot at uh, 96 frames per second. Uh, if I shot with the shutter at around 100th of a second, that means I'm getting more or less basically a 360 degree shutter, or basically, you know, as slow of a shutter speed as I can get away with, because you can never go uh, with your shutter lower than your frame rate I'm rec recording. Uh, and so in this case, the shots look, you know, very, again, blurry. Even though I'm right now shooting at 100th of a second. When, for example, I was shooting the video at just a regular 24 frames per second, and then my shutter was at 100th of a second, uh, then the shot looks drastically, basically everything looks, the motion looks uh, drastically sharper. Uh, so you gotta be aware of that, that it's only in correlation to your frame rate. So if your frame rate goes up higher, you're basically gonna be uh, speeding up uh, the, your, your shutter speed to kind of match that. Uh, and like I said, if you want the classical sort of a film look, then you're gonna be shooting with 180 degree shutter, or another way of saying that is two times your, uh, your frame rate, and that will be your shutter speed. Uh, so let's say in the case of, you know, uh, if I'm shooting at 96, or more or less, let's say 100 frames per second, uh, you know, slow motion, then if I wanna get a 180 degree shutter kind of a look, I should be shooting at more or less 200 or 1 200th uh, of a second. And that's how the shots here now look in slow motion. And you'll notice that there is motion blur there, but it's not, you know, crazy exaggerated and it kind of looks more natural. Now, if I wanted those slow motion shots to look, let's say, way faster or, or like way sharper, as if they didn't have motion blur, that's when you'd want to go even higher uh, of a shutter speed. So uh, four times the, you know, my, my frame rate, that would be one four hundredth of a second. And that's how the shots look uh, right here. So remember, in filmmaking, like I always say, there are no rules, just good and bad suggestions. Uh, and the same thing when it comes to the shutter speed or shutter angle, there is no such rule as 180 degree shutter. It's just a suggestion, meaning majority of films, especially way, way back in the in a, in a early cinema days, were shot with 180 degree shutter, like I said, not because they wanted to, but because they had to. And that's what basically now we associate with the sort of a classic film look doesn't mean that you always want to stick to that. Like I said, in some cases, it might be beneficial to shoot with a lower or even higher shutter speed. Now, one more thing I wanted to say about the shutter speed also is that if you're shooting, let's say, like a, let's say an interview shot, or let's say you know, a shot like, like right now of me just sort of sitting here and talking to the camera, in this case, you probably don't have to worry too much about the shutter. Why? Because, uh, you know, if there's not a lot of motion, if the, the shot is, let's say, static, it's not, the camera is not panning, or let's say there's not a lot of motion in the shot, like me, just somebody like me just sitting here talking. All you're really seeing, you know, moving is maybe my hands a little bit, but other than that, it's just my mouth, meaning there's not that much motion. So what that just simply means is that the different shutter speeds are not really gonna be as visible. The different effects that they create are not gonna be as visible because, you know, there's not gonna be ever any motion blur because there's not a lot of motion in the shot. Uh, and that's like a little tip I'll give you is like, for example, a lot of times I'm shooting outside, let's say doing interview with somebody when I was working for example with the, on this documentary that I shot last year. Uh, a lot of it was shot outside in the bright, you know, sunlight. And I wanted to get those sort of a classic portrait shots, meaning I opened the aperture all the way up uh, because I want to get that shallow depth of field. Then I would, uh, you know, put the ISO to the lowest setting, let's say ISO 100 if I could. And then I would adjust my shutter speed whatever you know I had to adjust it to so that the shot would look you know not too bright and not too dark now a lot of times that's when people start putting in ND filters and things like that because with you know with the lens open all the way and shooting outside with broad sunlight you, the shot is going to be always you know way too bright even at ISO 100 but I'll tell you this you know if you can avoid putting extra filters or glass in front of your lens it means your shot is going to look a bit sharper a bit better clearer um, so in many cases I would not even bother putting an ND filter I would just simply crank up the shutter speed. I would get the shutter speed to even as high as one, you know, one thousandth of a second. And because it's just a shot of somebody, let's say, sitting and talking, 
there's not going to be a lot of motion blur in there. So I don't have to worry about the fact that the shot might look a bit stroby or that the motion blur might be you know, not noticeable enough. So that's like a little tip, like I said, is if there is not a lot of motion in your shot, don't worry about the shutter settings. Just set it to whatever you have to, to get a good exposure. Anyways, now we're going to the next setting, which is the ISO. This is pretty basic. ISO just simply means uh, the sensitivity of your sensor, or if, it was, you know, if you're shooting on film, the sensitivity of your film. So you can uh, basically adjust it. You go with a lower ISO. Uh, you can see here on the left side, the little sort of diagram gets darker. So that means you're getting less of an exposure. If you go higher ISO, and just that depends on you know basically how high your camera can go, uh, that means that you're going to get more of an exposure. So definitely if you're shooting, let's say, with a slow lens, uh, let's say you're shooting at night where you don't have a lot of light, that's where sometimes you're going to be bumping up the ISO. But usually, at least me, I would advise to keep the ISO always as low as possible. So whenever I start doing settings, I keep it as low as possible, I adjust my exposure with the aperture and the shutter, and in, only if those two settings do not allow me to get enough of exposure, if the shot is too dark, that's when I'll slowly start increasing the ISO. The reason why I do it like that is because uh, higher ISO means, yes, you're getting more of an exposure or more brighter shot, but you're also introducing more noise. So, you know, every image sensor is going to be different. Some image sensors, you know, you can shoot up to ISO 10,000 and it still looks good. Some image sensors, if you go past ISO 800, it starts looking very grainy. So it really just depends what camera you're shooting with. Uh, but that's why I said I always like to shoot with the lowest ISO and only go up higher if I need to get a, a sort of a bigger exposure. So now sort of to kind of wrap this section up, uh, like I said, aperture, shutter, ISO, all these three settings can uh, adjust the overall brightness, darkness, or the exposure of your shot. But they also create other sort of cool effects that you as a filmmaker should know what they are and so that you can properly use them in your, in your productions. Um, now, when you're actually setting up a shot, uh, you know, that's when you have to start worrying about all these different settings and kind of know how one works in conjunction with the other. So here's like a little video where I'll show you uh, how I'm setting up a shot here of basically my wife and my son sitting here in the park and uh, sort of, you know, how I have to adjust the different settings to get those different effects. Uh, okay, so I'm shooting right now on a 100 millimeter lens on a micro four-third sensor, it's the Panasonic GH4. And that's about a 200 millimeter equivalent on a full frame. And anyways, right now I'm at f2.8, so the lens is open uh, as wide as it can be. Uh, so as you can see right now, only my wife and my son are in focus, and uh, everything kind of behind them is, is blurred out. Uh, and so this kind of shows you that even on a micro four thirds image sensor, you can still control the depth of field. So now I'm going to start closing the lens and kind of showing you what if I wanted to actually get the, the little you know, pond and the, the trees there behind them in focus. I'm going to close the aperture to, right now it's 3.5, let's go to f4.5. Now as you notice as I did that, um, the whole image got you know, drastically darker, it's actually slightly underexposed right now. And so that's why when you adjust one of those settings you have to compensate with the other. So now I have to, um, I could basically compensate it with the ISO, which is at ISO 200. But because we're outside and we have plenty of sun and we actually have a really high shutter, I can just slow down the shutter to get more of an exposure. So I'm going to change the shutter now from uh, 1 640th of a second down to uh, 1 400th of a second right now. And that's how the shot looks. So definitely uh, it's, it's you know, a little bit bigger depth of field and you have more things in focus now. Um, especially if you compare it to the previous version. You can see before things were a little bit more out of focus. But now getting back into this shot, uh, I'm going to adjust it yet again. Uh, so I'm going to close the aperture even more. So let's close it to f8. As you can see, it got drastically darker. So I gotta, again, again, I got to compensate with the shutter. So I'll open the shutter or slow down the shutter. So right now the shutter is one uh, 100 to, to, to 25th of a second and this is how it looks we're getting decent exposure and you'll notice definitely a lot more of the background is in focus you can start seeing those uh, like the, the the beginning of the lake there the, those little shrubs there behind there uh, they're in focus now if I wanted to get everything in focus let's say even those trees all the way behind there then I really gotta close the, the uh, aperture so I'm gonna close it even more uh, so I'm going to go now from f8 to, let's see how far I can go, f14 for example. 
or maybe even more f18 so f18 i'm way underexposed so i gotta again compensate with the shutter so i'm going with the shutter to 1 50th of a second uh, and but at the same time at the, you know i'm still underexposed so that's when sometimes you're gonna have to compensate with uh, iso and even though we're outside but because i have the lens closed at all the way to f18 even with the shutter basically being you know more or less two times the frame rate uh, it, it is um, it's still basically not enough light so i'm going to go into iso and i'll bring up the iso from iso 200 to iso 400 and now i'm getting decent exposure and as you can see the background the trees behind them everything is in focus uh, and that's how you can control your sort of depth of field just with the aperture definitely when you compare this to the the first settings that we had where it was just them that were in focus so that's how uh, you, you can see how you can adjust your, your depth of field all right so now that we're done with the top section of the cheat sheet we can go on to the bottom so first one here we have is the focal length so so the focal length is the distance from the optical center of the lens to the image sensor and that is always going to be measured in millimeters uh, really what that means is the higher the millimeter number the longer sort of a zoom in zoom you, you have on your lens so there's more of a telephoto lens it is and the lower the number is uh, the wider the shot is going to be so less it's going to zoom in um, so that's basically how you would uh, you know if you're looking to let's say get a lens that allows you to zoom in and get let's say wildlife or sports for example action if in you know real close-up then you would want to go something really high like in the case of my little graph here you can see 300 millimeter 40 millimeter is going to be a nice sort of a wide angle uh, lens anywhere thing in between like a 50 millimeter i think is like the ideal kind of a mid-range lens um, and it's a lens that i shoot probably 90 percent of my work so any kind of a good fast 50 millimeter lens i would say, always suggest to anybody uh, that you it's this first lens that you always get now uh, another thing you have to be aware of though is focal length also changes other things like i said aside from changing the field of view or how much you're zooming in or zooming out it also actually changes the depth of field it, it will have an effect on the depth of field maybe not as much as the aperture itself the aperture by far changes the depth of field or the look of it uh, you know drastically but like i said in conjunction with that the focal length can uh, if you were for example shooting on like a smaller image size sensor camera like let's say you know the panasonic gh4 which is a micro four thirds image sensor uh, it might be a little bit harder to get shallower depth of field there uh, and that's just simply because it's uh, a little bit higher, high, harder to get a wider shot because the image sensor is so much smaller but you got to also be aware of that the image size sensors doesn't actually change the depth of field or how much of your shot is in focus or out of focus that's again another misconception uh, and i did a video years ago which i'll provide the link to that in the description of this video so you guys can check it out where i kind of talk about how to control the depth of field and what are the three settings but sort of quickly to recap like i said one Thing that actually changes the depth of field is the aperture setting the other one is the focal length or you know to kind of explain it quickly the the longer or the bigger the focal length so let's say the longer the lens like a 300 millimeter lens means the depth of field is going to get narrower and if you want to get a wider depth of field you have to go to a lower uh, focal length lens let's say something like 14 millimeter and then the third thing that actually changes uh, the way that the depth of field is or how big it is uh, is actually the distance to your subject so let's say right now the camera is focused in on me if i brought this camera really close to me and then focused with the same settings that i have right now the depth of field will get drastically narrower that's why usually macro photography uh, is very very you know has always those you know super narrow depth of field where you have it's very hard to get the focus right and that's because you're shooting with a you know let's say a 300 millimeter you know telephoto uh, lens but then you're very close to your subject as you're getting you know maybe some bugs or something plants and then on top of that you're usually going to be shooting with the aperture all the way open and that means that the, in that case the depth of field is so narrow it's like measured in millimeters um, so anyways that's more or less how that op operates and then the last thing here you'll see on the cheat sheet is the white balance white balance is basically the color balance of your or the temperature of your image sensor of your overall you could say shot uh, so depending on what light or what light you're shooting in you have to adjust your white balance otherwise the colors in your shot are not going to look right so for example if i'm outside right here and i'm shooting with uh, you know proper settings for sunlight uh, then the colors are going to look right 
Um, now, for example, in this case, I'm getting a shot where you know the subject is actually is in the shadow. Then I should set it basically to whatever that little icon here says. So in the shade, it says you know more or less 8,000 Kelvin. Now, if, if you're shooting with like a DSLR camera, uh, most of those will have different white balance settings, meaning they'll have these little icons. So they'll have a little shade icon or a little you know fluorescent or let's say for lightning, uh, uh, you know, flash photography, photography, or for example, cloudy or sunny or, you know, little light bulb for indoor, for example, lighting. You can pretty much just set the white balance by going to those uh, settings. So then in that case, you can say it's very easy. But if you ever start working with proper cinema cameras, um, like I said, like for example, the red camera or any of the black magic uh, cinema cameras, uh, then that's when, you know, you will not have these little icons in there. And that's when, uh, knowing the proper Kelvin temperature setting is very important because like I said if you have the completely wrong setting then the colors are going to look completely wrong so an example of this shot you know we're in in the shadow and the Kelvin temperature should be around 8000 um, but because in this case let's say I didn't know what the setting should be and I uh, left it at 3000 you can see that the colors look drastically more blue uh, so if you don't want those colors to be blue, you got to adjust it, you know, I said to the proper Kelvin uh, setting. Uh, and then reverse happens if, for example, you're shooting uh, indoors with, let's say, uh, tungsten lighting, but you should set the white balance to something that's not, not even close to uh, indoor lighting, which would be around 3000 Kelvin. Then that's when the colors are going to look drastically warmer. Um, so in this case, again, you have to adjust it. Now, many cases also, you'll want to sort of adjust these settings to create different effects. If I, for example, shoot um, sunrise or sunset, I'll on purpose actually sometimes offset the Kelvin temperature to get the shot looking a little bit warmer. So it looks more dramatic, the, the sunrise or the sunset. But definitely, you know, knowing what the different Kelvin settings uh, is, is very important and knowing how to use it uh, in conjunction with your light, uh, it's, it can create really cool effects or it can create really drastically, you know, horrible looking effects and it can ruin your shot. Uh, so practice all of these and these are basically all the settings that you have to worry about. So if you're a beginner or even somebody who's got some experience but you just want to get better at getting the perfect settings in your, you know, when you're taking photos or, or doing videos, then uh, like I said, this little cheat sheet is going to come in handy. Uh, so like I said, I would just recommend that you guys you know, download the file, again, go to tomantosfilms.com slash downloads, download the, the JPEG from there, and then just print it out on a 4x6, uh, basically, photo, um, and always carry it with you, and, you know, you can just sort of look at it for reference, and, and that's probably the best way to learn how to operate any camera, because at the end of the day, all cameras, doesn't matter what buttons they have and shape and size and all that stuff, they're all going to have all of these settings. Um, so that's pretty much, like I said, my, my tutorial for today. And this is, you know, the reason why I wanted to do this for you guys is to kind of show you pretty much how I used to learn, you know, back in the day when I was first experimenting with first photography and then video, is that I would actually, I kind of created this little cheat sheet like this. Uh, you know, of course I did it very primitive back in the day. I just kind of did it with a pencil, but I carried that with, my, with me so that whenever I forgot what each setting did, I could always quickly look at it for reference and I knew what setting I had to adjust to get the right effect. Um, so like I said, if let's say the colors look wrong, look at the white balance. Uh, if your depth of field doesn't look right, if you want it to be you know, more things in focus or less in focus, look at first your aperture setting and then your focal length, for example. And then if your motion blur doesn't look quite right, again, look at your shutter speed. And then if you're not getting enough or let's say you're getting too much of a you know, exposure or the shot looks too bright or too dark, you can look at all those three settings, including also the ISO. Uh, anyways, hope, hopefully this uh, was very helpful to you guys. If you guys have any more questions or even suggestions, maybe something I can add to this, let me know. Um, and as always, if you guys want any other information about uh, film gear reviews, uh, no, camera reviews, lights, things like that, as well as a ton of filmmaking tutorials, as always, you can go to tomantosfilms.com. And, and if you guys have any sort of filmmaking you know, or equipment related questions, uh, chances are that I've already answered those so you can just go to my website and just click the little search icon and type in you know whatever it is that you need an answer to also don't forget on my youtube channel uh, if you've already subscribed uh, then click the little gear icon next to the subscription button uh, and make sure you turn on the notifications for my youtube channel so each time I upload a new video like this one you guys will be notified anyways thank you guys and I'll see you next time